Hi, I'm Angela Pepper, and you're listening to the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. Today, we will be talking about many things, including the fire hose technique of successful indie author publishing. Hey there, Strategic Authorpreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We're here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 24 of the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're talking about the fire hose approach to success with USA Today bestselling author Angela Pepper. But first, our usual update, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing this past week. So, Michele, what have you been up to? Um, there is a resource uh, right now that is available for free. It's a book by David Gogran. Uh, it's titled Let's Get Digital. Um, you know that I, Crystal, I always suggest one resource of self-publishing or entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm reading this book now. Uh, it's the fourth edition. Uh, David put it out for free, and I think it's going to be free indefinitely. Or for, for, what under, for what I understood, as long as he can keep it free. Uh, so I definitely suggest you, if you're interested in self-publishing, now to self-publish and platform building. Uh, to get this book because I'm almost uh, one third of the way through and I'm like devouring it. It's basically, um, I already mentioned Following, which is another short uh, a book that he wrote about platform building and how an author can build that and why it's important. But Let's Get Digital is more into the nitty gritty of the business. And there are so many resources about cover creation, platform building, the business of being an author, uh, formatting things. Uh, it doesn't go in the details or all these things, but it gives you the right coordinate to do it right. And one amazing thing that he has been doing in this fourth edition is that Crystal, he created a page with all the resources you can possibly need from how to make your Facebook page or how to tailor with Canva a Facebook ad to how to start your own uh, welcoming sequence with the email. So there is basically everything you possibly need uh, as a self-published author, either that you're starting out uh, or that you are even at an advanced uh, level. Me, myself, I'm finding so much value. I really can't recommend uh, the book enough. So let's get digital. I don't have a copy here, unfortunately, because it's like in the internet, uh, but uh, it's uh, from David Gogran. It's really, really uh, suggested. Maybe, I don't know, um, Crystal was moving. Maybe, maybe she had it somewhere. <laughs> There you go. Yes, that, that's it. I, I do, that. in fact, I have the third edition. So the fourth edition is the one that just came out. But for anyone watching on YouTube, I am holding up the book. And uh, yeah, this is the third edition version in print, which I ordered about a week before he announced he was putting out the new one. <laughs> it was terrible timing. But I will read the new one digitally, so that's fine. Yeah, so it's really great, and I really recommend it. Um, in my authorly world, I am doing uh, one thing um, that I'm not sure how it's going to go because it's kind of an experiment. I can call it like that. I am trying to write basically two stories uh, this month at the same time, meaning I'm going to write one story and then when I'm finished with that immediately after, I'm going to start writing the second one rather than waiting another month and writing that. And the reason why I'm doing this, this is part of my, my 12 by 20 challenge of writing 12 stories in 12 months in 2020. It's because I really want to focus a couple of months on a bigger project, uh, which is like writing a, a series and then uh, uh, publishing it. Uh, but I need time to focus on the planning stage. And I need, really need to, of course, keep my word and my promise to my audience is like, you have to write and publish one story each month. But the only way I'm going to make this fly, Crystal, is I really need to work my butt off. Um, and I need to uh, use this uh, month to really focus on the creative, generative side of things so that uh, uh, August and September can really be focused on really the writing of uh, this uh, uh, fantasy series. So. Wish me luck. I'm not sure how it's going to go. I've never done this uh, uh, before. Um, and I'm curious to know, what have you been up to? 
well, I have been playing with magic. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, gotten back into writing my River's End romances that have a touch of magic in them. And so I've been researching all kinds of things. So learning about runes and oracle and tarot cards and palm reading and all kinds of stuff like that. Psychic abilities, which is not technically magic, but I feel like there's some overlap in terms of things that people can do that have just a little touch of something extra to them. So I've been just reading, really digging in, and I've ordered a book about runes that is supposed to arrive any day. So I'm very excited about that and have added to my collection of tarot and oracle card decks with a uh, like a handmade Irish ogham, which is like a kind of tree symbolism stuff so I don't know too much about it yet I'm about to learn a whole bunch more but a couple of the families have Irish heritage as I do in in River's End who have that magic lineage so I'm going to dig in and see what I can learn about that um, so those are the resources that I've been focused on I haven't been doing too much nonfiction reading actually aside from the not about writing and publishing anyway just digging right into the creative side of things which is a whole lot of fun so I am loving that um okay so we are going to talk about the fire hose approach to building an author career which is super interesting but before we dig in with Angela, you know how important reviews are in the book world, and they are equally important in the podcast world. So if you can take a moment to leave us a review, we would be forever grateful. And now let's dive into our interview with Angela, and we'll be back at the end of the interview to decompress a little and discuss what we've heard. So welcome to Angela Pepper, who is a USA Today best-selling author, according to her website. And you write mystery, and you have two different kinds, right? Cozy mysteries and supernatural mysteries. Is that how you would describe them, or would you describe them in a different way? I, it depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, the, even the supernatural ones are cozy-ish. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty warm and fuzzy and uh, family friendly. Not 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 a ton of gore, although I can't really say that because then I'll write something really gruesome and and then Pigeon people head. say, "What do you mean it's not gory? You had a brains all over the place." And <laughs> <laughs> we all have our different thresholds, I suppose, mm -hmm. compared to horror than not so gory, but. Uh, yeah, everybody definitely has their different lines of what is scary or what is uh, even supernatural. There's a lot of stuff that I consider sort of light magic that I wouldn't even think to mark as supernatural, but, but not, uh, not everybody has those same definitions. So what kind of magic do you have in your books? Uh, well, my main character is very powerful. She can pretty much do any, anything. Uh, which makes it hard to plot because you'll you'll give her a power or you'll teach her a new spell in book one, and I'm twelve. Oh, I'm writing book thirteen now, and every time she gets in a jam, I have to go through my uh, series bible and have a look at all the spells that she can do and her powers just to just to make sure that she's not um, being too stupid, <laughs> i.e. that the author hasn't forgotten that you know. Uh, so what's funny is like there's no such thing as like a locked door to, right. to a witch it's just it's so easy anywhere so she's actually a fairly moral person so she doesn't just you know randomly break into people's houses when uh, if she wants to find something out or uh, she kind of she eavesdrops a little bit on people but I, I think uh, yeah her, her powers are great and there's almost nothing that I can't figure out a way for her to do. So the powers are, they're vague. It's not like a, a thing where she just does one thing, like she hears people's thoughts or something, but right. it's really difficult. It's so challenging. You can, you can have them do anything. So that means that you can have them do anything. And how are you going to limit your choices? Anyway, so that's what kind of magic, you know, levitation, um, uh, making the dishes wash themselves, you know, fun sort of fantasy fulfillment stuff. But um, she's not exactly great with her love life. Right. 
She can't. She can't fix that by magic. Yeah, I hear that's a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so how did you, and I guess to dial back for those of you in the audience who do not happen to be psychic and know how Angela and I met was many, 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 many years ago. We met for the first time, I think about a decade ago. Um, and we were just kind of much earlier on in the process. I think it was a workshop uh, somewhere in Vancouver. We were getting ready for a big conference and uh, working through some pitching stuff, if I remember correctly. And since then, you've done all kinds of things along the way. So maybe can you fill us in on a few highlights of how did you come to be doing what you're doing? How many books do you have? That kind of thing, just so people have a sense of kind of where you're at in the writing journey. Okay. Uh, 2010, I was getting a little burned out on making pottery, which is a thing that happens. And I was looking for a new hobby. I started writing, took a creative writing class with this really mean lady um, who was amazing because the more she was discouraging toward me, the more excited I was about writing. <laughs> so, um, which I think, have you know, but the class was encouraging and some of the people I met were, were pretty cool about it. And so I believed what everyone told me about how authors don't make a living writing. Mm. Everyone says that. I believed it. And so I set out my first uh, couple books. I just wrote something that seemed appealing to me. I wrote a young adult kind of coming of age book and I was querying it back in, I think it was 2011 when you and I met. Yeah. And then the whole indie publishing thing took off and I wasn't really, I was getting some interest from agents in my first couple books, but nothing was really coming together. And then I found out about the wild world of indie publishing. And so I started putting my work out there and it was amazing to have people read my books. It was a uh, fulfillment of a lifelong dream that I didn't even realize I'd had until it was happening. And that made me very happy. And then I found out that some of these jerks were making a whole bunch of money off their books. <laughs> and I said, tell me how you do that. Because like, I'm pretty happy now, but I think I'd be even more happy if I also got some money for this stuff. And so then that became another uh, another layer to the fun of it, which is I love marketing. And I used to work in website design and do marketing for people. So I knew how to use Photoshop and do my own covers. And so then I started selling my books, but there wasn't a huge markup or market with uh, adult readers with the kinds of books that I was writing. So I was writing sort of more middle grade uh, so I switched into romance just on a lark with, with a new pen name. And it was pretty exciting to have people reading my books and paying to read my books. And um, ultimate, the ultimate <laughs> in the writing life is being paid and having readers. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And then, um, okay, so that was like 20, I think it was 2012 or 2013 that I first hit the USA Today bestseller list with uh, my romance pen name with um, uh, New Adult was really popular at the time, which is sort of angsty, I don't know, drama, drama stuff. And uh, the, sat out on the porch of the house with my the neighbors who lived downstairs who were a lesbian folk band. And I, I told them I'm a best-selling author and they were like really excited. And we, st we sat in the front yard and we had a beer and I thought, well, this is, this is the life <laughs> you know, <laughs> to get to, it's kind of cool to get to do things that you didn't even really know that you wanted to do. Yeah. Sort of a overshoot your goals. And then of course the inevitable burnout because when you, get paid to do something that you love it kind of it weirds it. it makes it weird yeah. it messes messes with your head a little bit we humans have these just these weird systems where we, we just inadvertently kind of like destroy our own happiness and the, the more you understand about it the more it makes sense but you can't really trick yourself anymore so long story short uh, sometimes you have a successful career 
and you know that if you just write more one more of this book that's exactly like this that it'll do well and you know you can sit in your porch with your neighbors and have another beer but the second time around it's just not as good as it was the first time around so you have to keep uh reinventing yourself so you have mm-hmm. to i mean i get it and that i understand why madonna did what she did we <laughs> yeah. we <laughs> we authors kind of just she wasn't doing it necessarily for them she was probably doing it for herself because she needed to do that yeah so yeah so now uh fast forward couple romance pen names couple ventures i i did a shared pen name with with another author which is uh really um it's really cool to work with someone on something and to have that team thing going um and then i ended up getting into cozy murder mystery because i realized that it was actually quite similar to middle grade fiction a lot of similar uh themes about uh friendship and not as angsty um and kind of more of a plot driven uh the narrative drive comes from like a mystery i like writing a book with a sort of an external thing driving the action forward i don't really have the hang out uh, i don't really have the hang of like personal growth kind of literary stories i don't know maybe one day so that's how that's how I got into mystery. And it's funny because some of my early young adult and middle grade novels were basically witch cozies. Right. I just just it I didn't even know it was a genre at the time. Yeah. So, kind of looked into it. I'd say I'm I'm really lucky now and how I uh keep it fresh for myself is I try to find the challenge in every book. So I'll do a, a slightly different genre or a I'll play these silly games with myself where I'll just set some sort of arbitrary way that I'm going to write this book like that I'm going to go through and I'm going to write all of the characters physical descriptions because right. I hate writing those yeah <laughs> so I'll go through the whole book do all the character introductions and write all their descriptions first and then I go in and I do the the dialogue and the action and it's not the perfect way of doing it, but it makes every makes every book different. I hate yeah, writing. Yeah, kind of layering it in. That's in, an interesting way to think about it because it's that's like old offset printing where you have the four different colors of plates and you basically stamp a different color on top of each one until you get the full picture, right? Um, yeah. They do that color separation, so it's kind of a neat way to yeah. think of of printing a story where it's it's layering in those pieces. Um, yeah, and it's funny because that they don't even they don't even do that kind of printing anymore because everything's digital. But yeah, it used to be CMYK, mm-hmm. and I I had a boyfriend who was a, a pressman, and I actually he would look at flyers and say, oh that the that the, the cyan is off or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of old timey things, speaking that of old timey things, but the children's anymore. picture books are still some of them. I think are actually printed offset still out there oh. in the world. Um, well that makes sense yeah because it's not like a pizza delivery flyer yeah Yeah, if you're gonna do a few thousand of them um then it it, I think anything after about 2,000 becomes worth it to do offset because the press setup is so involved but then the print cost per unit comes down a lot um once you get past that point uh it's pretty cool I have some um from back in the days actually when I when I first met you we have some of our plates from a world of stories which was a an anthology we did as a literacy fundraiser and the printer sent me the four colored plates and they're still they're they're metal and they're super sharp and scary but they have um each different residues of different colors on them it was very it was a really fun way to see that but anyway that's what came to mind when you said uh layering in those elements um mm. that's really fun is there a couple other Sort of ways you've tried to write a story in terms of a different process so I think that's a cool thing to explore right uh well different different levels of outlining so I'll do extremely detailed outlining one book and then I'll do really light outlining the next book um I always come up with something something yeah. silly I I remember reading once that the I think it was John Truby was saying that the he's a screenwriting story guy. Mm-hmm. He was saying that the real pro screenwriters they put in the dialogue last. Yeah. Um 
And so I've tried, I've tried doing that sort of creating the whole story and then putting the dialogue in last, but really that's just an outline. Right. Yeah. So yeah, just, I play around with different, um, the process or I give myself a challenge, like write 2000 words today or write one chapter or try to speed write it. And uh, it's, it's hard getting the productivity out of yourself. That, that's the <laughs> tough part. Yeah, we got to use all the tricks at our disposal to get around those little avoidance. The fear level is high when it's something with high stakes for you as a creator. And you have this perfect vision in your mind of how it's going to be. And of course, extracting that and making it a real thing is not flawless as the process goes. Yeah, I've I've found interesting things through talking with other writers um, and discovering things about yourself. Like, for example, I have almost no visual imagination. I don't see anything like a lot. Oh. It's weird, but a lot of writers will just sit down and they're just, the, the scene is playing out in their head and they're writing it. I have nothing. There's nothing in there. Interesting. I, don't, it's, it's, I don't know how I'm able to write, but I literally, it, the story doesn't happen until I'm putting the words onto the page yeah. and then it becomes very real. Um, but it's not there until I write it. So that's why character descriptions are so hard for me because if I, if I go and I write what the character looks like, then I can see the character and then it's really clear to me. But, um, you know, from book to book, I forget and I have to go back and I have to like figure out what they look like. I have to, it's it's almost like I have to write it for myself. Right. So that I can. Interesting. It's fun. And do you use visual cues? Like, for me, I'm I'm terrible with geography and layouts of things, and I have to use floor plans that are a real house to describe because I can't picture it in my head. But for characters, I usually pull a stock image or an image from the internet somewhere of what that character looks like because I don't remember it very well either. Like, is that something that you find helpful, or is it? Uh... Um, I, I guess you can uh, occasionally. I'll imagine a, an actor, mm-hmm. like I'll cast it for an actor. Um, but for the most part, I just reread over the descriptions. So for example, in my series Bible, I'll have, um, like there's a recurring character named Frank and every time I describe him in a book, I'll describe him a little differently. I don't do a copy paste. Like it's, yeah, I don't know if you remember Nancy Drew, but it was (laughs) a copy paste description every time. Um, so I do a new description. So then every time he appears in a book, the first time he appears, I have a new description. So I add it into the um, the series Bible. And so I go, I read all of that over and it creates this really uh, clear image of him. And I'll just kind of go with whatever, uh, like in the early books, I didn't realize that he had like a crooked, like a crooked chin. And then at some point he had a crooked chin. And then I really, I really like that. And I could picture it. And so now I always mention it. So it's sort of like it builds up in, in layers over time. Yeah. Excellent. Back to the layering again. That's going to yep. be our, that's going to be our theme. So let's, let's apply that layering theme to building an author career because you've kind of done that process multiple times with different pen names, layering in those different pen names and experiences to kind of get to where you are now. So what are some of the stages that you think kind of happened through the, through that process of building a pen name or building a writing career where they're I think the big I think the big breakthrough for me was when I realized that people don't really follow authors and they don't necessarily even know whose book they're reading right <laughs> like not <laughs> us we know <laughs> and our audience we know what we're reading but most people don't know who they're reading and yeah. so uh so the big breakthrough for me is that every series that you write is a separate business. You might get some crossover from uh, one of your series to another similar series, but I've, I've got 10 years of, of data of sales of different pen names and different series. I can run a massive promotion on one of my mystery series. And if you just look at the sales chart for, for my other stuff, it is as though nothing happened. Right. The, the, cross, <laughs> the crossover between uh, different series is just, it's really low. You, now, the people who do crossover, they'll be your, your most supportive and amazing 
fans and they are really important. They're the ones who post the reviews. They're the ones who send you like the encouraging uh, comments on your Facebook page, which makes you happy. It, it's all very important. Um, but when I realized that nobody cares about me, however, they really, really care about my book characters, right? then that was sort of like the, the magic thing. Like Angela Pepper, you know, they could kind of take or leave her. But like Zara Riddle, who's in the book, they love her. They right. love her. Yes. And if Angela does the wrong thing by Zara, then they're mad at me. <laughs> right. So Yes. <laughs> so once you realize that, you think, well, uh, my website, my Twitter, my Facebook page, those are all about Angela. And they don't care about Angela. So definitely have a website, have a mailing list, have all this stuff. But I don't, I don't suffer any kind of delusion that they really care what's going on with Angela <laughs> more than just like a passing curiosity. Yeah. Um, so I would say like my whole marketing, my whole marketing comes from understanding that the characters that I write about are my business. Yeah. That's so that kind of make, little, make, make a little sense. It does yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think that's really interesting because we do, you know, we have this idea that if we just build up our own author brand, that we're, which is anything that we launch is going to be snapped up by our readers. But mm. in fact, and I have heard stats quoted before, and I wish I could remember the source, but I can't, that around 10% of readers will make the jump with you when you go to a new series. Like if you've built up an audience um, that you really can't count on any more than about 10% uh, that will just read it because it's you, as opposed to there was some direct connection. I think if you can do a sort of bridge where some of the characters cross over, like the spin-off series they do on TV all the time, with a, they take a, a character from one series and they make them the main character of a new series, then you can sort of lead a few more people across that way, but that people really do, as you said, get attached to a certain world, a certain setting, a certain uh, cast of characters. And that's really, really what they're interested in. Yeah, I did at my book, um, between book five and six, most people with series know that there's a big drop off after book five before you hit book six. So on my book six, I actually switched uh, the main character point of view and I went back in time, which people do not like, um, but I like. <laughs> so, uh, so I had a big drop off between five and six. But then once I got book eight and nine out, there was no drop off. People just kept reading right through because I thought, well, maybe this isn't exactly what I had in mind, but they want to keep going. Right. That's a funny thing. But I would consider when you when you take an existing character and you branch them off, um, I would consider that still basically the same series. I don't, it's not as risky of a move as doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a slightly higher percentage of. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a little hard there. It's a little bit hard on your ego, for sure. If you if you're getting into this business <laughs> to have people you know validate you and say that you're great and your work is great and your writing is great, um, that won't it may not yeah. it may happen it may not. <laughs> but Don't you make have it to. your primary motivator for sure. <laughs> no, well we're we're going through something interesting in our house. My husband, who is a big sci-fi nut, has been working for the past three years on a sci-fi trilogy. And so we held back his first book so that we could launch all three of them at once. And he was really excited that his, his first reviews came in and they were really good. And I said, you can't really believe them because if you believe your five stars, you're going to have to believe your one stars. You have to go with how you feel about the book. And that's, that's the truth. That's the reality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and you know, my co-host on the show is a sci-fi fantasy author. So if you're wanting to give your husband a little name shout out um, and send our listeners to check out his books as well, you are welcome to reveal his identity. Oh, yes. Uh, it's not a secret. I've told my readers and uh, to both of our surprise, a, a bunch of them went and read his books and thought they were great. Nice. Um, uh, oh, his 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 author name is Darcy Troy Paulin. Okay. P-A-U-L-I-N. And what's the As, series name? Um, boy, I've stared at it enough. Um, Lost Colony Uprising. 
okay. uh, and the book titles all say Starship in them. Okay. Yeah. But he's he's doing great. As of as of the moment that we're recording this, he is doing a free run on book one. Ooh. And we've got some ads booked, and it's the first big marketing push. Nice. And then in the next couple of days, book two and book three come out. And so he has told me he doesn't want the login to Amazon to see the book sales, mm -hmm. but he just asks me every couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wise person who knows where their boundaries need to be. It can be a terrifyingly addictive click, refresh, 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 refresh. It is weird. It yeah. is like, it just sends us a little pellet of happiness or something. It's so bizarre. Yeah, we're like little gerbils, like pushing the little validate me water button. Um, I know, it's so weird. <laughs> and, and, and the sad thing is you just need a stronger dose all the time. I used to get excited when I sold one book. Yeah. <laughs> and now I look at the charts. I'm like, only 100 books today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how spoiled. we grow. Yeah, yeah, spoiled. But also and spoiled, but still at the same time, very grateful. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to kind of have come back around to starting over with multiple pen names and multiple projects. I would say, what did you learn from Angela's adventures and other pen name adventures that you applied to releasing your husband's books in the present climate? The big thing is the technique of holding back the early novels and releasing a batch of them all at the same time. Right. It's just it's so boring and yet it works yeah you you can release book one uh people can love it but the the chances of you being i mean you can put a link at the back of your book for signing up for your newsletter but so few people are going to do that mm -hmm. and um yeah it's just it's just sad to think of all the people who read who read the, the first book and then two years later they don't know that the upcoming books come out because it was just one book and anyway it's um it's sometimes it's easier to just kiss goodbye to those early sales that you might have had um yeah. just so that you know that there's a a better chance that you're gonna I don't know it's almost like well you're you're you are in competition with other books like yeah, absolutely. don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I mean, I know we're all in this to help each other, but you you really are fighting over people's mental real estate. And if you can get someone to discover your book and then read three of your books where they they laugh and they cry and their hearts break and they you know, go through this emotional journey, they're going to remember that book more than they will uh the book that took them a third of the way there. So, it's a yeah, little for sure. And how far apart are you releasing these three? Um, we just, uh, so with my husband's book, we just put up book one, I think about three weeks before we released two and three, uh, just to give it some time to get the reviewers to post some reviews on book one and I don't know, kind of a soft launch thing. Yeah. And the first three weeks we made $25. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Rolling I, in it. <laughs> no, I think that's really I think it's really important because like in our writing group people be believed that because he lives with me that he was going to have this amazing magical perfect launch and everything was going to happen and you know the stars would align. And I think it's important to say that, no, even knowing everything that I know, uh, he made, it was $25 for the first couple of weeks. It'll ramp up now that we have some promo booked and we're, we're doing a free, uh, free giveaway on book one for five days and uh, the next, and we have some advertising booked. And so it'll grow from there. But um, man, I, I could not sell consulting services to save my life because I will tell people that and I tell people that in the writing group and they just think, oh, well, you must be lying. You must be trying to keep the competition down because that can't possibly be true. How could you put your heart and your soul into these books for years and years and they're so good and you do everything and like that's all that you make? It's just, yeah. Anyway, we I had a Zoom meeting recently with my writing group and there was a lady who asked about about marketing and 
I told her how it is and she's just just so upset about it just like well I didn't get into this to have to learn how to use Facebook ads and and uh, outraged and I just hey man take the outrage down down the hall <laughs> we yeah. have the freedom uh, we have the freedom as authors these days to put our work out literally nobody is stopping me from publishing any dumb idea that I get <laughs> over the last 10 years and I've had some pretty dumb ideas nobody stopped me yeah and when I was a kid growing up no one was able to do that you had to go through a publisher so I mean on one hand sure you can complain about how it's not very glamorous to have to learn how to run advertising campaigns but on the other hand you get to you you yeah. get to be in charge anyway that's uh that's my little soapbox moment for the day yeah, I think if you are, if you are the kind of, and we are the strategic entrepreneur podcast. So if you are the kind of person who's willing to embrace the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to really just accept that the business, you don't, and in fairness, you don't have to embrace the business part. There is nothing that says you have to do that unless you want to make money. Right. If you just want to write and put your books out as a hobby, great do that, but stop whining about not making any money. <laughs> if you're willing to embrace the business part, then do what you can and learn how all of these tools work. And then you can have some expectations of, you know, revenue generation happening. But unlike in our witchy books, the magic doesn't just happen all on its own, right? Magic always comes at a cost. So if you want magic in your sales numbers and your other things, huh? universe is going to extract that in another way. <laughs> I just hope I don't listen to a podcast one day where a wife makes her husband's new book a smash hit right out of the gate because then <laughs> then that, that'll sort of raise the stakes. But then we'll all judge yeah. you. Yeah, but that'll be then and this is now. Yeah. So I think you're safe. You're safe. Well, about the selling thing, um I think that we're I think that you and I and some of the people who started over 10 years ago, I think we're really lucky that we had to deal with those brick walls of traditional publishing um, because I think it made us more, more appreciative of the tools that we have nowadays. Whereas yes. these, these kids these days, these kids <laughs> these days, they jump into an uh, internet forum and they say, I wrote a chapter of a book. Uh, could someone tell me how to make it perfect? And tell me what genre to write so I can instantly make a million dollars and quit my day job yeah and oh you my kids. favorite is like this tool that instantly formatted my book into a perfectly ebook um didn't know this one thing about my book and so this is this is broken this is silly and I'm like do you know how long it used to take to hand code a, an ebook when you had to like html and re stupid little formatting thing I'm like you don't understand and then you sound like that person who's like I had to carry my brother both ways to school uphill in the snow with no shoes <laughs> but but we really do have a different perspective and that what used to take us you know uh, potentially hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars for InDesign to be able to lay out a book and you know and then then figure out how to get it to a printer physically <laughs> like there was discs involved this was a thing um yeah it's a wow it's a whole you are world. <laughs> your <laughs> dinosaur um your knowledge of old things is older than your age appears to be <laughs> yeah you may well, be accidentally dating yourself 2007 was the first um indie published book that i did and it was a full color children's book which was offset printed in manitoba by freezens and there was no indie publishing there was no any of these tools that was not a thing uh, mm -hmm. So yes, I, I did all of the things about the absolute hardest way you could have done them at the beginning before there really was an industry of indie publishing. So um, I, yes, I am older than I look, true story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can relate. I used to do website design and I remember designing for the average monitor size, which was 640 by 480 pixels, at maximum 256 colors, half of which were green. Yes. And, and people access the websites through dial up. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, it is, it is quite, a, it's miraculous when you look mm -hmm. at the, the, our current publishing process, 
when I compare like my original indie publishing process to what, you know, your first indie publishing process would have been like in that 2010, 2011 kind of era. And then look at what we have access to now where it's this abundance of tools and these instant like click a button and you're distributed around the world inside of 24 hours it is so amazing to see and it it is interesting to see how that then trickles out to the capacity of the indie author because if you're not spending thousands of hours on the publishing side you do have the opportunity then to turn to either ads or to generating more content and that brings us around to something that you and I talked about when we were setting up this session was that there are a kind of a couple of different approaches to how you can grow an author career or grow a, a brand or a series brand. I don't know if you want to elaborate that a little bit for our listeners. Uh, yeah, firehose is just a word I use all the time to explain. Um, like, like everyone knows that you have to put out a lot of stuff and you have to work hard and but the word a lot is, it's, it's not as good a description as fire hose. Because <laughs> when you say fire hose to someone, they get it. When you say you have to fire hose out content, they understand that that's, oh, far more than is comfortable. <laughs> yes. Or, or um, so yeah, the, the two big ways that I see other people making it in indie publishing is by either fire hosing out content or fire hosing uh, ad spend. Right. And you could do a combination The the people who are, I, I'm a bit Amazon centric and I apologize. Other, other vendors for eBooks do exist and I've been on them and I like them. Um, but Amazon has a bonus system called the Kindle unlimited all stars. And 100% of the people who are taking those all-star bonuses, they've got two fire hoses going. They've got yes. content coming out monthly, if not more, uh, and they have high, high ad spans. Like yeah. the 10 grand a month is like nothing. I'm sure, I'm sure there are indie authors who are spending 50 grand a month on ads without a doubt some. there are <laughs> yeah and it's yes. a little and that's what I mean by fire hose like far more than any person would feel comfortable with yeah and I think the idea of a pressurized line is also important there because it isn't just that you are putting out a whole bunch of content you have to keep that flow going in order to maintain that momentum and so yeah. that's the second piece is there's got to be more in the tank that's going to follow in order to keep that working for you it's not you put a whole bunch out and then you just sit back and watch it do its thing yeah the whole idea of passive income it's kind of a it's kind of a myth although there is there is a certain amount that anything will sell on its own in kind of a set it and forget it method so you can still make your first in series free and it's it's more of a trickle <laughs> but but it does work. I've got some stuff in my backlist that I don't have the time and energy to put a lot of focus in and I'll just make book one free and sell a couple copies of book two and three. And yeah, the water metaphor. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, it is valuable. And, and just so for a little bit of context or scale, you know, when we're talking about a lot of content, you mentioned like something every month uh, is what a lot of authors are doing. I think that magic space is about six weeks between things on Amazon that after that point, so they say after release month, you're going to lose about 30% of your sales every month if you don't do something to offset that. So that's where a lot of people, even if they're not doing massive mad, uh, massive mad ad spends, will um, still be doing uh, just a reasonable amount of advertising to keep that flow up a little bit so that they don't lose all the momentum after a launch month if they do have a little bit of a break between releases because if you're writing full length novels and going through the full editing process and everything else you can't necessarily be putting out one of those a month <laughs> lots of people I mean three to four full length novels in a year is four times what most traditionally published career building authors would have done like a book a year is an aggressive publishing schedule in the traditional world for the most part, unless you're talking romance and category romance, in which case, you know, four to six was kind of expected. But 
even then, I don't know how much of that is an artifact of the changes in the industry to try to compete with indies and how much has always been like that. Mm -hmm. I like with my, with my schedule, I like that no one's going to quit reading my series because I put out too many books for them to keep up. <laughs> that's what, that's <laughs> yeah. a nice thing. I, I, I think I've, I'm currently, I'm only, I'm only putting out maybe two books a year in that series. Yeah. And I like, I like knowing that if someone's a fan of the series, that when a new book com comes out, that they will be, they will be excited and it'll be an auto buy yeah. for them. So to, to my tips for like bringing up the, the fire hose of content, some people are really productive and they're just how they're geared up. They can write three or four books in a month. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, not everyone can do that. There are other ways that you can achieve that. So I did a, I did a shared pen name once with a couple of authors where we were writing these uh, romance serials. And so we, we were sort of uh, taking turns releasing books under the, the pen name. And um, what was another thing? Oh, uh, just shorter books. Yeah. Uh, so my husband, he wrote these, this, this trilogy. They're 100,000 words each. And now that he's got the three books out, he's figuring out how to do adventures with the characters. And he likes kind of more of a TV serial format. So he's going to do short adventures with like a big arc. Yeah. So he'll be, he's still, he's kind of a slow writer, but, but yeah, I mean, there's things you can do to increase your release frequency. Yes, absolutely. And writing short, we in fact have another podcast episode that um, will be out by the time this one airs, which is talking about some opportunities and advantages if you are able to write some shorter stuff. And you can mix and match as well in your links and have some variety. Uh, mm -hmm. And that buys you the freedom and the ability to do some more sort of fill in the gaps releases between your big big books in your series and to get some action being generated and to keep those algorithms working in your favor for sure. And the other thing is to know that I, I consider a 30,000 word book, a book most readers do. So um, if you're putting out 30,000 word books and they're complete stories and people like them, there's, there's no need to apologize in the description for for the length of anything that's over 30,000, you don't have to call it a novella. I mean, technically it is, but um, I've, I've got a friend I coach and she's doing these mysteries around 35,000 words and mm. nobody has complained about the length of them because people are happy. They're happy if they get a complete story. So I think some of the, so, some of us just have these, um, I don't know, it's almost like these these good girl anxieties. I don't know if you're firstborn. Are you firstborn? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, of course you are. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so am I. Big shocker. Um, but like we have to get over, we have to get over these things of, um, oh, am I allowed to do that? Yeah. <laughs> am I allowed to put out yeah. a novella and just act like it's a real book? Uh, yeah, you I totally can. did that. And that's exactly <laughs> what I thought. And it was like, I don't know, I think, well, I'm still working on it, but it's been like three or four years now of, and I only, I, I only have novellas, um, which is an interesting conversation, but to, to this day, you know, the longest book I've written in the fiction world is I think it's about 36,000 words. Oh, and so uh, that's, it's an interesting conversation to have that perception of ourselves that it's not a real book because you know in the mm. categories where I write if I had been pitching to a traditional publisher I would have needed 55,000 words and I couldn't get there which is why I was writing novellas because I could get there and so it it is that interesting as an indie person you have to make those definitions of what it works for you because it works for you I mean mm -hmm. the old rules were in place because they knew that a category romance should be X number of pages, which took X number of words to fill up on their printing press template. It wasn't because, you know, it wasn't a good story if it varied from that. It was because those presses were set up at a specific size, shape, and number of words and pages, and you had mm -hmm. to fit that model, and that was how that worked. So that's a, it is an interesting exercise for all of us as our own bosses and our own CEOs of our strategic authorpreneur companies to decide what works for us and for our author business. So 
Yeah, I found something point. helpful for getting over your kind of like your good girl tendencies was to actually hang out with some really shady people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say that with the utmost respect. Uh, I mean, people who are very business savvy when it comes right. to publishing. Um, it can be an unsettling experience to uh, to to run in circles with some of these people, but there's a lot to be learned. Um, like just like the the things the things that some people do, you think, well, you would never admit to doing that on a podcast because people think it's yeah. wrong. But um, it's like like sending out like even just something as simple as sending out review copies. Some people get so upset about the whole idea of uh, sending a free book to someone and hoping that they'll post a review. And oh, but but if you only send it to people who are fans of your work, they're only going to post good reviews. Uh, to which, so <laughs> like, that's, it's still okay. It's okay to send your book to people who are going to like your book, and then to say, "Could you please post a review?" Like yes. it is okay. It is not. It, like I've seen some people do some immoral things, and so I know that the the bar for <laughs> the bar for what's <laughs> questionable is it's it's a bit further out it's than definitely uh, not sending out arcs to your review crew. <laughs> it's it's okay. Yeah. It's okay if you knew about what was going on in the sausage factory and how the sausage was getting made for yeah. real behind the scenes. You're gonna be okay with your little kind of <laughs> your your things that you feel like even just like um you know, comparing your book to, to another book or saying something positive about your book in your book description. It's okay. (laughs) It's okay for you to say, this is a great book. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's something that we struggle with as writers so much is that if you can't say nice things about your book, nor will anyone else, (laughs) like who else is going to tell people to buy it? you are wearing all the hats. You are the marketing department. You are the publicity department. You are your book's ambassador and you have to get comfortable with crossing that line of your comfort in order to actually suggest people do a thing. Because I think we also make this assumption that the readers are just like us and they Mm. know that if they posted a book review, it would be super helpful. So if they're not doing it, it's for a reason when honestly is they just don't even think about it. Like unless you suggest they do it why would they think to do that they don't necessarily understand the industry or how that makes a difference most most people just think oh whatever like plenty of other people left a review already I don't have anything different to say what could one more you know I liked it possibly do um and so educating our readers and asking them to help us when when we need their help for things like posting reviews or you know would you like an arc copy um is interesting I think, to look at where those blocks are for us and, and how we have to get over ourselves. Yeah, I like, I like sometimes, sometimes I tell them, uh, I'll say, here it is, post a review. Just so you know, I'm not asking you to post a review to like boost up my feelings. <laughs> it's, it's a marketing thing. It's a business thing. Like I, I find that being honest is just, it's great. You You don't, you don't have to worry about contradicting yourself if you're just always honest. I mean, you don't have to tell them everything. You don't have to say like, I spent this much and I want to make this much or um, <laughs> anything unsavory like that. Like, oh, you guys better review this or I'm going to quit this series. But um, it's good to, it's good to, it's good to be somewhat honest about what's going on uh, without, like, sometimes I wonder if I should even tell people that like I publish the books myself, myself. I'm pretty sure most of them think Amazon publishes me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is an interesting conundrum of like, do you say you're an indie author? Do people know what that means? Does it just help other authors who are reading your stuff who get that you're indie? Like where, where is the usefulness in that? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think it depends a little bit on what genre you're in and who your audience is. If, if they, kind of understand from the beginning where that is and and if you're competing with traditionally published authors or not in your niche because that is very different um as well Mm -hmm. that you if they understand it's it's just little old you there's no marketing machine behind you there's no giant company who's sort of taking all the money from your sales and and 
supporting you also in the process, I think sometimes it, it could help actually, if people understand that, you know, you're a, a one person show and, you know, running the business along with the writing and everything else, then that can be helpful. But yes, mostly they just care when, when do I get the next book is <laughs> yeah. really the ultimate question and the only question <laughs> that they really care about. And it is that like trying not to be completely soul destroyed when you say, you know, you put out a book and not 24 hours later, someone's emailing you to ask when the next one is. And so oh. I think if we cycle back around to your original advice, which is like, write a few so that you can release them and that your answer when they're like, Oh my God, I love this is like two weeks from today or whatever yeah. it is, but you have a date, you know, when it's not this sort of amorphous, like eventually when I get around to it, um, or can pull this off amongst all the chaos of life. It's just like, Oh yeah. Thursday the 17th will be when that book comes out. Mm -hmm. Then they have an actionable like follow-up thing. I was really excited recently. Amazon extended our pre-order timeline. It used to be you could only put up a pre-order three months in advance. Yeah. Um, and now I believe it's a year. It is. is. That right. Okay. And um, that's nice because then for your super fans who want to support you and I, I think a pre-order is like a little, it's a little pat on the back of encouragement. It's, I, I love seeing pre-orders come in um, and, and not, not just not just the, the earnings because I don't get a ton of pre-orders. It's not like a huge chunk, but it just feels like I know as a person who consumes entertainment, I know that I get excited when my new movie or the new season of Better Call Saul comes out or whatever. I know how excited I am. And it makes me, makes me feel so proud that I'm sharing that little bit of that little happiness with someone else that, I mean, the future is so uncertain but it's nice that they know that in November they're going to get one of their favorite books. Yeah. It's nice. It is something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And as the writer, definitely knowing someone, someone specific is waiting for your book to be ready so they can read it. And they're that excited uh, is, is very motivating. It's like those sales count like 10 times. Yeah. For, well, they yeah. do because I think there's, percentage wise it's like one percent of readers will actually pre-order or something and so it's it's mm. this teeny tiny little amount which means that for every person who did take that action there's probably a hundred more out there who are interested in reading the book they just are gonna wait to commit um, especially because you can't pre-order if you're in KU so you have to just wait till mm. the book drops so I think you can safely multiply those numbers out um, adding a couple zeros, just like you can with blog comments, you know, for every one blog comment left, you probably had a hundred or even a thousand readers of that mm -hmm. post because people just don't engage like that. Yep. I have a newsletter list of, I think it's a, just under 4,000 people. And I will usually get pre-orders around a thousand for, for my pre-order books. And I find that when I, when I email people through the newsletter, that a new book is out, like 50 people would buy it that day from that newsletter. So yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why people are signing up for my newsletter and then they don't just run out and get the book on release day. But um, <laughs> I, I'll never understand it. It's like, but like, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's important to just know that like you, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's there's nothing wrong with you that like a hundred percent of the world isn't super crazy over your book launch day. <laughs> like it's okay it's okay if some people have a lukewarm appreciation for your series because those people <laughs> over time they also help uh, support your career so I don't like I used to get you know it's stupid that some of the things that you get offended by but I used to just get really bothered by people who would sign up for the newsletter and then like pretty small launch numbers and then I would email people like three times and then more people would buy it on the third email and then I yeah. thought well do I do I have to nag you into buying my book do I have to hit you with it three times and seven's oh. the magic number in marketing oh <laughs> <laughs> it's fairly horrifying but I find it fascinating I still have people downloading my first book in the series which is free in like 4,000 places 
and was published in 2014 and has never been a paid mm. product. And there's still people clicking in my newsletter to download it after being on the list for like two years. It's fascinating. I would say that's so, weird. Yeah. That's weird when but you have a just sale. Don't yeah. see or don't take action on yeah. things necessarily. Like it's, it does take a few tries and you don't know if they just skim past that email and their kids started crying after they mm. opened it and they didn't actually see what was in it. Like, you know, we forget that there's lives being lived on the other end of oh, yeah. this process. And so I think that is a good reminder to just, you know, <laughs> say it more times than we think we need to and be more upfront about the, will you please buy my book <laughs> in the, in those moments when that's the appropriate statement to be making like on yeah. launch week for sure. Um, well, that's I'm conscious that all of the minutes have gone by in a speedy okay. rush as they do. Um, but I would love if you will tell our listeners where to find you if they would like some witchy mysteries and or cozy mysteries. Sure, you can visit my website at www.angelapepper.com, spelled exactly how it sounds. My books are definitely on Amazon. They may be in other places from time to time. Oh, I'm doing really well in audiobooks, which we didn't touch on, but um, I really promote audiobooks to my fellow writers. It's um, just an amazing experience to have a, a narrator dramatize your book. It's, it's not a movie. It's better than a movie because if someone made a movie out of your work, they would screw it all up. Uh, but these <laughs> audio narrators, they read every word you wrote and they're just amazing. It's just, uh, it's the reward for writing a book as far as I'm concerned is getting to collaborate with an audiobook narrator. So all of Angela Pepper's audiobooks are in Audible and Amazon. And uh, one of my fabulous narrators, Tiffany Williams, has gotten us a uh, finalist uh, two years in a row for an Indie Audiobook Award. Nice. So that's exciting. Congratulations on like that. The, uh, it's like the Oscars. Let's be it honest. Is. This is the Oscars is. Of, Absolutely. of Indie Audiobooks. Amazing. <laughs> That is fantastic. Yes, it is a real rush to hear. Basically, it, it's like a radio play of your book, you know, with the accents and the characters and everything else is so fun. Um, yeah. And it does open up a whole nother world of, of listeners, readers as well, since it doesn't mm. tend to be the same people in both formats. Yeah. And I've always, I write for, I'm an auditory reader myself. I'm not a speed reader. So I write for auditory readers. And so it's just, it's just, it's my jam. It's totally nice. I think I thought my dream was to do eBooks and I love the eBooks, but I really love the audiobooks. Welcome back. So the interview with Angela was really, in my opinion, almost breathtaking. Uh, there were so much uh, things that I didn't know and that uh, her experience made shine. Um, I actually took a, a lot of notes. I'm not going to tell everything that uh, um, made my day and that uh, uh, shown, but there are a couple of things that I really want to focus on that for me, if dissected, um, are going to explain a couple of uh, elements that I believe to be useful for people that are serious about self-publishing. There is one thing that uh, Angela uh, says, uh, um, and I'm not going to quote her, I'm going to just paraphrase her, she says, most people don't know who they're reading. Um, and I'm talking about the readers here. Uh, they don't care about, uh, in this case, Angela Pepper, but they love uh, the characters of their stories. And this is something I've never thought about before. Um, I don't know exactly why, but I, I always, of course, and I think it's normal, I identify, identify with the books and with the characters. But again, I fail to see that it's important how the reader sees my work, not the contrary. Um, and this is something we already discussed when we were talking in a previous episode about uh, David Gogren approach with, with approach uh, to the reader's journey. Uh, so focus your, your attention as an author to the readers. Um, and I think what Angela says here can be connected to the same meaning that Devin said in his book. Um, for you as an author, it's important to ship content. You don't necessarily have the power to see how this content is gonna be seen. 
And I redefined the crystal freeing this um, phrase that she said, that Angela said. Most people don't know who they're reading. Uh, they really don't care about uh, our name. They care of how good are our stories and how fast we can write the next one. So I was wondering, uh, Krista, what do you think of this uh, um, particular approach to publishing, <laughs> focusing it not on yourself as an author, but on the, the reader's journey again? And if it's like, it does make sense or it doesn't really make sense, if, if we as an author should be more attached with our things, so we should really use more the business-like, uh, ego-like approach and say, okay, this is a product. The moment I finish this and this is the final point, I don't have control over that. The only thing I can control is the next book. Yeah, I think it's it's very freeing as an author to think about the fact that it isn't about you because it, it takes the pressure off, as you said, in terms of when we're trying to figure out what do I send out to my list through my mailing list? You know, what am I going to say in those emails? What do I put in my newsletter? If you think about it in terms of, oh, you have to be witty and engaging and you have to be something or someone that people want to follow, that puts a lot of pressure on you to kind of put yourself forward, which since an awful lot of authors became authors because we live in our heads with our imaginary friends most of the time, we often have a hard time promoting ourselves as something out there in the world. And so personally, the fact that I can relate to my readers and connect to my readers over a mutual love of these characters and books and this world is very helpful for me to be able to kind of get past that shyness or that awkwardness that I feel around putting myself out there in that way. And, you know, there isn't the pressure to share all of the personal details and you can, you, or you better be able to generate legitimate excitement about the characters you've created because if you're not interested in them, nobody else is going to be. So I think that is a really great way of looking at it. And I have to say as a reader, because I read voraciously in my genres as well, I've read uh, probably hundreds of thousands of books by this point. I mean, I, have had long periods in my life where I've read two to three books a day in romance because I read fast and the books aren't that long and which I haven't had cable since I was well not ever actually <laughs> I've never had cable so all the books get consumed but if you ask me to, to rattle off the author's names I can't tell you most of them and I'm an author so I pay maybe even more attention to that than some readers do but I can tell you the name of a series or the characters that stuck in my brain and that is, I think, really where those connections happen. So that's something definitely I think she, she was really on the right track with that. And I think is a huge relief when you acknowledge that for sure. Yeah, I think like uh, discussing this, it's important for that reason that keeps the pressure off our shoulders, but at the same time made her realize how they think, which should be something that is always, always at the back of our mind as creators, right? Um, and there was something else that actually uh, Angela said, and it's something that I'm using to link uh, to the same title of this episode. She mentioned the uh, fire hose, uh, right? Uh, approach uh, uh, to different kind of things. And I was confused at the beginning because I didn't understand what she meant by fire hose or fire hosing, she used also that verb. And she basically defined this word uh, as fire hosing. For example, fire, fire hosing out content uh, means to put out uh, a lot of content. Or uh, fire hosing, add, spend, uh, means of course to spend a lot of money on advertisement. Um, this is something that is major, especially at the moment uh, I believe in many authors' career, uh, Crystal, and I think this is something that you also saw uh, for yourself. Uh, when you started um, uh, producing and publishing uh, one uh, uh, novella per month, um, and you continued doing that consistently month after month, after month uh, you had your own challenge. Uh, that was something significant for you. That basically changed uh, not only your approach to publishing, but it's also when you started seeing 
really resolves also on the visibility and the sales kind of things. So she's basically saying uh, there is a point, uh, and I do believe this is a uh, like one of the starting point uh, where an author can see, okay, now things are changing to me, which is incredibly difficult to get to this point. So I'm gonna tell you my five cents on this theory, okay? So this is, um, um, I'm gonna use a very awful word, but this is the breaking point. Meaning like if you pass this point and then you can kind of make it as an author, if you keep going, the, uh, releasing content. But before this, uh, over here, there is basically an understanding here uh, that Yudor both believes uh, their work as art instead of craft, so they delay before because of perfectionism. So they maybe release one book every two years or every three years. Um, and this is, I'm just saying this uh, uh, based on my experience, okay, Crystal, my experience in the past seven years in the self-publishing uh, realm. Uh, so I always um, worried about uh, the content that I was providing, uh, the form. So I would have a book finished and then I will just reread and changing it, changing it over and over again. What Angela is saying, it's actually different. Uh, she's one of those authors that uh, went over that point uh, and she just releasing product because she believes in herself and in her story. So she's able to release more than one work per year. Uh, there was a point in her career, if I'm not mistaken, she was releasing several works uh, uh, per year. Now, if I'm not mistaken, again, she said she's releasing something like two. But there are self-published authors that at this moment are releasing one work per month. Can you believe that? Like releasing and not just giving it away for free like I'm doing. I'm talking about the polished, great content with a great cover, editing, consistently every single month you do that every month for a year or two that's a fire horse approach that's basically the definition because if you are releasing that many content that much content uh, you're ensuring that you have a backlist first thing of quality works uh, doesn't matter the length we already discussed about that a 20,000 word novella is as valuable as a full-length novel if you're doing it right we spent an whole episode uh, about talking about uh, the value of uh, uh, short uh, uh, stories. Um, so fire hoosing means this basically, having the liberty to understand me as an author, I'm providing entertainment as much as I can, uh, I can, as much as I can nail down this entertainment and I can make it better and more consistent, my, luck as an author is going to increase. But that's why I was talking about the threshold. I'm here, I think now. I'm still, I'm figuring out things. Hence why my challenge, because I don't know what I, I don't even know what I like to write. So I'm experiencing and I'm experimenting. But once you are on this threshold and you get to know what you can do, what is the amount of things you can really publish consistently uh, with the quality on your back, uh, once you know uh, enough about marketing, so you can market your book, not as a professional, you can be helped, uh, but as a person that knows what she or he is doing, once you know your strength and you know what you can do, and you know that you are delivering a, delivering a product to an audience that wants your stories, then you break that point. And I think it's something that happens also, happened also to you. Uh, Crystal, when you were releasing consistently those romances, um, you saw a spike on the chart because you had so much product, so many product uh, you could deliver, uh, you could cross-promote them, you can put ads on that. If you had nothing, you can't promote basically anything. So I just thought that was very useful, uh, even when uh, she used that approach to the advertisement. And she was mentioning sometimes there are other that are so powerful and so established and so rich, let's say, that they can drop easily ten thousand dollars per month, if not more, like fifty thousand dollars per month on advertisement. That's the equivalent of the fire hosting approach to advertising. Not everybody can do that, <laughs> especially like I'm talking about. I'm experiencing for, with a few uh, dollars per month, so but I can see that happening. Authors that have a big chunk of stories, they already have uh, doubled down their effort on the publishing side. 
now they can also use the resources and make their work more visible. So I wanted to know your opinion on the fire hosing. I thought it uh, uh, very interesting. What do you think of it? Yeah, I think, and I've experimented with both sides of this. So on the nonfiction side, you have a less content, less frequent releases, but using ads to fill that traffic hose. I think one of the important parts to think about when you think about a fire hose is that it needs a constant stream of water. It needs a pool from which to draw the water or a tank from which to draw the water so that there's always more water to push through the hose and it needs to be pressurized. There has to be always something coming behind it. As soon as the water levels get too low or you start running out of water or the pressure drops, right, you end up with, with not great results out the other side, right? And so that's where it really comes in. It's not just about having a, you know, a regular things happening for a while. It's about keeping that flow and the system works as long as that pressure is up. As soon as that pressure drops, it doesn't work anymore. And, and that's what you see. And so it, it has been really interesting experimenting with both of those approaches. And for me, definitely the more fun one is the building with the content fire hose because I love putting up the stories and you get the reader interaction and that really feeds the joy of the writing process and it all kind of takes on a bit of a life of its own. So for me, that feels much more energizing than the advertising. And so I think you can scale a little bit. You've got your fire hose and you can adjust water versus pressure or, or size of the hose or whatever. You can make adjustments in the way that you're building your own author process. So I think it's just important to know personality wise what's going to fit. Some people don't write as quickly, but they are rock stars with their ads. And so they, they make that work and there is no right answer. It doesn't matter what you choose to do, but you do have to do something <laughs> in order to get that built. And I think especially at the beginning, it's really hard to get any kind of momentum. And what we would call a tipping point is the phrase that is often used for what you call the breaking point. So it's, you know, I think when you are going up and up and up on a roller coaster, it's really hard to get to the top. And then you get to the top of the hill and then you get to coast a little bit because you have momentum built up and you can, can go and ride that next uh, loop or spin or go up over the next hill without it taking so much of your energy because you've already built some momentum. And that's really what it's like from the author career side. It is shocking when I look at the difference between, I had two Christmas seasons in a row, one where I released something at every three to four weeks from September till Christmas. And it looks like going up that roller coaster. Um, because you do get that momentum and you really do get that pressurized kind of thing. But if you can't keep following it up, then you see a drop after. And you can absolutely pick that momentum up again once you start releasing content again. But I think if you're trying to decide how you're going to feed your hose, how you're going to pressurize your release schedule, you want to think about maybe you need to stockpile some work. And that's what I found was I couldn't stay on top of it with all of the marketing and all of the releasing and all of the writing at the same time. You, your focus gets divided and it's very challenging. So some people solve that by hiring people to do certain pieces of the process so that they're not trying to do everything. Other people will do what I'm doing right now, which is take a year to just write like crazy and then have a whole bunch of stuff in the tank, right? We're filling up the tank and we'll let the hose start spraying things out in the fall when um, the next round of releases starts. But I think you do have to be aware that with each sort of consecutive book you add to your back catalog, every task you do after that multiplies out by the number of products you also have. So your management responsibilities also do replicate. So just something to think about. And Really, it just boils down to where is your passion, right? What, what are you going to prefer? Because anything you enjoy doing, you're going to be willing to do more of. And so if you're not avoiding it, you will get momentum and growth much, much easier. Now, speaking of momentum and growth, one of the things we like to do is challenge ourselves with a question from the curious jar. And so lid is off. I am sticking my hand in. You're going to tell me when to stop. Up now. Blue. A blue one. 
Okay. So who is your writing mentor officially or not? So okay. yeah, I could dive into that. Okay. I have, um, I think, I mean, Nora Roberts is up there because she is somebody who, she published her first book the year I was born. <laughs> so I've been reading her stories. I think I read the first one when I was 11. And so I've been reading her stories always. And so I, you know, like every author, you have favorites, not favorites, but I really enjoy uh, the ones that dive into different areas of background really deeply. So I think she does like a standalone title each year. And those are fascinating in terms of how thoroughly she can bring you into that world. So it's, it's, the background of the character, it's the jobs they have, but the language that's used throughout the books is so attuned. Like if it's a florist who's the main character or someone who runs a garden shop, all of the descriptive language is around the world of gardening subtly. So you don't really notice until you start breaking it down. I think the, the characterization is so well done. Um, and I really love the fact that she writes on her different name with detective-y stuff that's kind of a futurist in some of the books and some of the books are murder mysteries and some she really just they're all kind of blended around a romantic plot for the most part but I I like the spirit of play and I like the consistency over time of building these worlds and I noticed too that some of the stories uh, are, are woven together not in a way that they're an explicit series but if you've read her books you can recognize characters from some other parts of her writing that kind of reappear so I do I do really like that so I would say she's definitely probably an unofficial mentor plus her dedication and hard work is intense she is a woman dedicated to putting her butt in the chair and uh also very generous with giving back to the writing community and really has always been a strong voice for women in business and the romance community in general and has been very good about standing up integrity wise to support other authors who have had work stolen or things that have happened and maybe weren't in a financial position to defend themselves on their own. So I definitely admire the, the humanity side as well as the um, actual writing and character development side. That's interesting. Thank you for buying this and Um I was thinking while you were talking, um, I do not have what I could think of of a single writing mentor. Like if you're asking me like works that have influenced me, I would just go on with Tolkien, Isaac Asimov, the, uh, the very good and very good stuff. But I wouldn't call them mentor, but while you were talking, I was thinking I have uh, an uh, innate curiosity over how other authors are going about their craft of writing. So you would uh, remember that I'm a fan of Masterclass and I use every occasion I have to just use one of the stories that I've uh, heard uh, from them. So I guess like what I'm trying to say here is that I have an idealized version of a writing mentor that is composed by many things uh, that are part of different writers. So uh, I try to really get to know the writers that I really respect. Um, and I try to make uh, an Id idealized version of them in one massive uh, author. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense or there's something of a, like a supernatural kind of things, but let's say that uh, I really respect uh, Neil Gaiman, um, uh, uh, Brandon Sanderson, Patrick Rothfuss, J.R. Uh, Martin, uh, J.K. Rowling. None of them really is my mentor, but they are some compose an individual that I'm trying to follow and that is going to... Uh, instruct me on my writing style and make it better. So I have this idealized version of the writer that I want to be. And I guess this uh, ethereal mentor uh, composed by many facets, uh, many faces of different authors that I follow and respect uh, 
uh, compose the mentor that is instructing me. So I would say, yes, for how weird this can sound, I don't really have a name to give to you, but I have just the idea. The idea that there is something out there that is composed by all the information that I have from all the authors that I respect and that I'm learning from it. All right. Well, we want to hear who is your writing mentor, official or unofficial. So you can drop that in the comments below this episode, wherever you are watching or listening. And if you want to send us a curious jar question, you can email it to ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com and we'll add it into the mix. And for show notes, links to resources we mentioned and coupons or discounts, uh, on tools we love, visit us at strategicentrepreneur.com. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode, where we'll be talking about how to decide where and when and on what to spend your hard-earned money. So tools, services, how are you going to make your cash help you level up your writing career? So until then, happy writing, and we'll see you next week. See you next week. best like signals and you, no, you I just past all of them <laughs> well this make for a very good outtake <laughs> yes well oh. done bonus okay. marks for that <laughs> because i'm not seeing you now girl okay let's see okay now i can see you so if okay. i do something funny okay ready yep, I, didn't tattoos, know that. Yes. I didn't know yes. that the i have one on my wrist i have one on my lower back I'm getting another one just on the bottom of my, like the base of my back of my neck here. Okay. Um, this one is a Celtic symbol for water, and it's also like the triad, but it's for flow because it's my writing hand. Oh, um, and I have one that is on my back that is a Celtic spiral that I got in Ireland. And Jared, while I was getting the tattoo, um, wrote for me the meaning and drew a picture. So it's it's that. Mm, okay. It's just no, a spiral, it's super simple. Okay. But this page is 18 years old. 18? Wow. That was when, when we were in Ireland, he came over like right after we met, he came to Ireland and we, um, that's where I was living and um, traveled around and right before we came home we both got tattoos my friend there owned a tattoo parlor one of the girls oh, from my school that... of course so. oh, uh, here we are at the end of the podcast uh, I just got a call from Jeff Bezos he's my boss at Amazon and he says I need to get on it because I have a pre-order coming up so I have to go write that book for Jeff we're buds I call him Hefe. Well, we've reached the end of the podcast and we're all out of tape. There's no more tape running in the reel-to-reel, so we have to go. Sorry.